welcome back. Are you ready for another practical tutorial that everyone should watch, no matter what? Gather your family and friends together for this one. I'm gonna teach you something that's been baffling you for years. <laughs> We're gonna talk about those confusing food nutrition labels that are supposed to be useful to you, but are mostly worthless because you don't know how to make sense of them. While they're supposed to serve the general public, they don't. And that's because they're designed on a level that's suitable more for nutrition experts, not laypersons. And that's where I come in. I'm that crazy menopause lady who helps you understand complicated things so that they're not complicated anymore. So you don't need your book or your notes to get today, but you might want to grab a package of food. And don't worry, you know I'll demonstrate everything every which way. Now, I'm a gynecologist, so you're probably wondering what in the world I know about nutrition labels. <laughs> well, if that's what you're thinking, you would be correct in assuming that gynecology does not qualify a person in understanding nutrition labels. But if you've been following me for any length of time, and especially if you've watched my videos in order, you know that I'm not quite your typical gynecologist. <laughs> not only do I have a completely unbiased approach to menopause, I also give you a full education in many disciplines and categories of options as they pertain to menopause. And diet is one of those categories. I've studied a bit of nutrition among other things. <laughs> so watch this video and you be the judge of whether or not I'm qualified to teach you this stuff. In the last tutorial, you learned that you can't believe anything you see written on any food package. Nothing, literally nothing that's written on any food package means what you think it means. Well, that leaves only the nutrition label to tell you the truth. It's that little rectangular thing somewhere on the package. The nutrition label is always in a white rectangular shaped box. So the obvious next step after learning that everything else on the package is basically a lie is to learn how to read the one thing that tells you the truth. And that's this white box that's on every packaged product. So I'm gonna simplify and translate this nutrition information just like I do with gynecologic information. Please, please, please watch the video that comes before this one, before watching this one. Of course, you really should watch all my videos in order. Otherwise, you are shooting yourself in the foot. So let's start by looking at the entire nutrition label. Then I'll separate it into its component parts to simplify its interpretation. So here's what you'll see when you look at the white rectangular box. This is the whole thing. The nutrition label that you're looking at on the screen now is naked. There are no values for any of the ingredients. So you see, I think numbers make it complicated, so I want you to just look at the items designated on the label before getting into anything else. And this nutrition label that you see now is white, just like what you'll see on an actual food package. Don't worry about any of the details yet. Now I'm gonna highlight this label in different colors to illustrate some things. So what I've done is highlight different parts of the nutrition label in different colors. And we're gonna discuss them by color. Breaking it up like this simplifies everything. We'll start from the top of the nutrition label and work our way down. So the first thing on the label is serving size and number of servings. I've highlighted that in gray. And here is an enlarged version of it. The serving size will be in a standard unit, such as one cup or one piece or one package. And in parentheses, you'll see the metric equivalent. Now, supposedly the serving size is the quantity that a person would typically eat at one time. The problem is that the serving size may not be what you typically eat at one time. 
If you're used to typical American sized servings, the serving sizes you see on nutrition labels will shock you. <laughs> They're tiny. You can get a feel for how tiny they are by looking at the number of servings on the package. So compare your normal serving size to the serving size on the package. So how many servings do you think there are in a pint of ice cream? This is actually ice cream substitute. I don't eat ice cream. So this is cashew nut ice cream. How many servings do you think there is? It says four servings. If you're a pig like I am, you eat the whole pint at one time. Well, if I'm quadrupling the serving size, I'll have to quadruple everything else we talk about too. Next, you'll see the number of calories in a single serving. Here's an enlarged version of that portion of the chart, and I've highlighted it in yellow. And now you'll see an isolated enlarged version of it. You hear the word calories a lot. And we tend to talk about that word in a negative light. But calories are a measure of energy. So the number of calories is the quantity of energy that you'll get from a single serving. Now, there's a basic guide to categorize calorie content. 40 calories is low. 200 calories is moderate. 400 calories is high. In general, and this is based on a 2,000 calorie per day diet. And the big thing to take into account is how the calories change depending on your serving size. If you eat four servings, you have to quadruple the number of calories. So if you eat the whole pint of ice cream, which is supposedly four servings, you have to quadruple the number of calories in this part of the nutrition label. And next to the calorie count is the number of calories from fat. Pay attention to how many of the calories come from fat. And if you eat multiple servings, you have to multiply the number of calories from fat accordingly. <laughs> and that brings us to the section of the nutrition label on fat. And I've highlighted it in red. And here it is, enlarged. This entire fat category is literally too fat. And what I mean by that is that most people, Americans in particular, eat too much fat. So the red section is one that you should limit except for one part of it. That's why I made it red, because you know, red means stop. <laughs> Total fat is the sum of three different kinds of fat. You have saturated fat, trans fat, and unsaturated fat. Unsaturated fat includes both monounsaturated and polyunsaturated. The first two, saturated and trans fats, are bad for you. The last one, unsaturated fat, is good for you. So you should limit your intake of saturated fat and trans fat. So let's elaborate on these two a bit so that you know the skinny on them. Saturated fats are animal fats, period. It's in meat and dairy products. So the easy way to limit or omit your saturated fat is to limit or, or omit meat and dairy. It's simple. If it has a face or a mother, then it's full of saturated fat. Saturated fat is what causes heart attacks. By American standards, less than 20 grams of saturated fat per day is the goal. But by best health standards, it should be as close to zero as possible. Here I have some pepperoni slices. There are two grams of saturated fat in one serving. And here I have a dairy product, cheese. The nutrition label indicates that one serving contains four grams of saturated fat. Now, one serving of this cheese is one ounce. That, there are eight servings here. That's not much. So next is the trans fat. Now, this one is infuriating. <laughs> trans fat also causes heart attacks. 
but there are lies buried in the information you get about trans fat, even in nutrition labels. The nutrition label is the one place on the package where you're supposed to get the truth. But in the fat, trans fat row, you don't get the truth. Here's why. Do you remember in basic math when you learned about rounding up to the next full number anytime there was any number higher than a four after a decimal point? So 0 0.5 became 1. This is especially important in situations in which the 0 0.5 has great significance. There's a lot of room between 0 and 1, and 0 0.5 is closer to 1 than it is to 0. So everywhere else, 0 0.5 is rounded up to 1. But in the trans fat world, it's different. Here, in the trans fat world, 0 0.5 is rounded down to 0. And that one little quirk can kill you, literally. The FDA allows the food industry to list 0 when the food actually contains 0 0.5 grams of trans fat. Now this is even more significant because the recommended amount of trans fat per day is zero. So here you have a situation in which even if the nutrition label says there are zero grams of trans fat, there may actually be 0 0.5 grams per serving. What this means is that all the food company has to do in order to be able to print zero grams of trans fat on the nutrition label is to decrease the serving size to a small enough quantity to deceive you. Here's an example. This is one of those cooking sprays. How many servings do you think there are in this can of cooking spray. You know, this is the stuff that you spray, you use to keep fruit from sticking um, to the pan or to flavor foods. It's like a butter substitute. This one's even got a butter flavor. The nutrition label says it has zero calories, it has zero grams of total fat, it has zero grams of saturated fat, and it has zero grams of trans fat. So what do you think? How many servings are there in this thing? 30? 60? 90? I mean, it's only a five ounce can. It's 141 grams. It's 463 servings. A single serving is one quarter of a second of spray. Can you even spray for only a quarter of a second? Do you think anyone actually uses that little of this stuff? This is a perfect example of what a huge problem this is. Two grams of trans fat per day is considered excessive. Excessive enough to cause an eventual heart attack. You could easily consume well over two grams by using a product that says zero grams of trans fat when it actually contains 0 0.5 grams of trans fat, trans fat per serving. So pay no attention to the number of grams of trans fat on any nutrition label. Instead, look at the ingredients. All of the following items are trans fat. If you see any one of them, don't buy the product if you want to avoid trans fat. All hydrogenated vegetable oils are trans fat. All partially hydrogenated vegetable oils are trans fat. Shortening is trans fat. Palm oil is, is trans fat. Palm kernel oil is trans fat. And coconut oil is trans fat. Fried foods, baked foods, margarine, vegetable shortenings, and junky snacks all contain trans fats. We haven't gotten to the percent daily value section, but when we do, the general rule for your daily intake of trans fats is 0% is best, 5% or less is high, 20% or more is deadly. 
Now for the good fat, unsaturated fat. There are two types of unsaturated fat, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated. You don't have to worry about which is which. They're both good for you. These are the fats from plant-based foods. Nuts, avocados, and olives all contain unsaturated fat. The vegetable oils that consist of unsaturated fats are olive oil, soybean oil, flaxseed oil, corn oil, canola oil, peanut oil, safflower oil, and sunflower oil. If you're eating plant products, you know it's unsaturated fat. It's that easy. So, the nutrition label on these peanuts says that there's six grams of unsaturated fat per serving, and one serving is one ounce, which is about 39 peanuts, but it's good fat. And now, for cholesterol. Unfortunately, you hear more about avoiding cholesterol than you do about avoiding saturated fats and trans fats. But the truth is that cholesterol is much less harmful than these other two kinds of fat. Your liver makes cholesterol and it constitutes about 85% of the cholesterol in your body. So you don't really need to eat it and there are different types of cholesterol. There's good cholesterol and there's bad cholesterol. The easy to remember that is the good is healthy, HDL. Healthy, HDL. H is for healthy. The bad cholesterol is LDL, L, lousy, lousy LDL. There you have it. H is for healthy, L is for lousy. But there's no distinction between these two on food labels. The best thing for you is to let your own body do the work of supplying your cholesterol needs. When it comes to nutrition labels, you should not eat more than 300 milligrams of cholesterol in an entire day. Here I have some shrimp. These shrimp have 145 milligrams of cholesterol in one serving. And one serving is three ounces, which is about 85 grams, and that's a quarter of this package. And these are tiny little shrimp. So, do you think you would eat more than a quarter of this package if you were eating shrimp? <laughs> the next item on a nutrition label is sodium. And I've put it in a pink color. That's because pink is kind of close to red, and sodium is another item that you should give pause to. You need to limit it. So, while your body needs sodium, too much sodium is quite problematic. It's one of the leading causes of high blood pressure. And high blood pressure increases your risk of heart attack. So you really need to limit your sodium intake. And that's not as easy as you might think. Why? Because sodium is a great preservative. And fast food is full of sodium. And prepared food is full of sodium. And restaurant food is full of sodium. If you eat out or eat on the run or eat easy to prepare packaged foods, you're getting way too much sodium. So if you, so you have to pay attention to the sodium content on nutrition labels. You probably don't even have to worry about getting enough sodium, but you do have to worry about getting too much. Here are some parameters. One teaspoon of salt contains two grams of sodium. Two grams is 2,000 milligrams. And you should never eat more than 1,500 milligrams in an entire day. That means you want the sodium content in most of your nutrition labels to be on the order of about 100 milligrams or less per serving. And that's still a lot of sodium. But here's the problem. Take this can of soup. This is a can of organic soup that says healthy on it. The FDA says that the food cannot be called healthy if it has more than 480 grams of sodium per serving. But if you look at the serving size on this can, this can is two servings. Most people eat the whole can. So it actually contains 780 grams of sodium. So sodium, beware, it's everywhere, it's hard to avoid. Okay, now we go to the carbohydrates. 
and there are different kinds of carbohydrates. So I've made the carb section blue. And here it is in isolation and enlarged. Like the fat section, the carbohydrates are divided into categories. Fiber is good, sugar is bad. So you want a lot of fiber and only a little sugar. So let's discuss each of these separately and then together. Fiber first. A food is high in fiber if it contains at least five grams of fiber per serving. And as a menopausal woman, you need more than 25 grams of fiber per day. If you eat an animal-based diet, you definitely don't get that. The percent daily value rule of thumb for fiber is 5% of your daily calories per day is low, 20% of your daily calories is moderate, and 40% of your daily calories is desirable. All fruits and vegetables and whole grains are high in fiber, but animal products contain no fiber. Here I have some kale, and this kale has three grams of fiber per serving. This is whole grain oatmeal, and it contains four grams of fiber per serving. This is a meat product, and it contains zero grams of fiber per serving. See how it works? Your fiber is gonna be in all your fresh fruits, vegetables, and grains. Okay, what about sugars? As you know, there are different kinds of sugar. We're gonna divide them into two basic categories. Simple sugars, which are the natural sugars, and complex sugars, which are the added sugars. Simple sugars are the sugars that are natural parts of fruits. Simple sugars will not be listed in the ingredients because they're in part, in, they're, they are part of the food as it occurs in nature. They're not a separate ingredient. You can eat as many naturally occurring sugars as you want. They are not harmful. You won't even be able to quantify them because no label will give you that information. The other kind of sugars is the added sugars. These are not naturally occurring. And the suffix for sugar is os, O-S-E. So all the words for sugar end in os. There's fructose and dextrose and malodextrose and sucralose and maltose. All are added sugars. A basic rule is to avoid, avoid biting any product with any kind of sugar listed as the first ingredient. But manufacturers have found a way to fool you on this. Since the first ingredient has to be the main ingredient and they don't want you to know how much sugar there is, they split up the different kinds of sugars so that they can list them each separately and not one of them will be the main ingredient. So instead of that listing sugar as the first ingredient, you might see oats, dextrose, high fructose corn syrup, canned crystals, brown rice syrup, corn sweetener, malt syrup, palm sugar, and invert sugar. Well, guess what? Everything in that list except the first ingredient is sugar. <laughs> so here I have some donuts. It says that one donut contains 12 grams of sugar. That's a lot of sugar per donut. So here's how you assess the carbohydrate content of any given food. I call this the carb to fiber, five to one rule. What you do is you look at the nutrition label. You look at the number of grams of total carbohydrate. And then you look at the number of grams of fiber. Take the total carbohydrate and divide it by the fiber. If the number is five or less, buy it. If the number is more than five, put it back on the shelf. 
The goal is for the fiber to dominate the grams of carbohydrate. You want a high number for fiber. You can ignore any percentages, just pay attention to the grams. So look at some of these examples. The first one has a lot of carbs, but only a tiny bit of fiber. 30 divided by 3 is 10. It goes back on the shelf. Don't buy it. All the other carbs that aren't fiber are sugar. The second one still has too many carbs for its little bit of fiber. 30 divided by 5 is 6. 6 is too high. It goes back on the shelf. The third one is barely acceptable. It just makes the cut. 30 divided by 6 is 5. So you can buy that one if you want to. And the last one is the winner. A third of the carbs are fiber. You can buy a few of those. It's that simple. Do this with every product you buy. This popcorn has 27 grams of carbohydrate, total carbohydrate. And 8 grams is fiber. So 27 divided by 8 is 3.375. That means and, and it has zero grams of sugar. Oh, and notice that there's no butter and no salt. It's just plain corn. You can sprinkle some cinnamon on it. It's delicious. Of course, the very best carbs are the ones that have no label, <laughs> fruits and veggies. You can buy and eat as many of those as you want. And finally, we're gonna get to the last food group on the label, protein. I've highlighted it in orange. When it comes to protein, it's not a matter of getting enough. Instead, it's about getting too much. And that's dependent entirely on the source. You see, most people have the misconception that you have to eat animal products to get protein. That's completely false. Vegetables have plenty of protein. Whether you eat green leafy vegetables or lentils or beans, vegetables have lots of protein. But of course, vegetables don't list their ingredients on a nutrition label. There isn't a designated gram requirement for protein in general. Here I have an animal product, and this animal product has two grams of protein per serving. But a serving is only seven grams. There are 12 servings in this little tiny container. Along with that seven grams of protein, you get three grams of fat, all saturated and trans, okay? Now, this is a plant protein, and it contains 28 grams of protein per serving. But there are only two grams of fat of which is saturated or trans. If you equalize the serving sizes, you have to multiply the serving size of the animal product by 8.1 to equal a serving size of the vegetable product. And you have to also multiply all the fat things by that same number. That means you get this comparison. The animal product has 16 grams of protein. The plant product has 28 grams of protein. This is for an equivalent quantity. For total fat, it's 24 grams for the animal product and two grams for the plant product. For saturated fat, it's eight grams for the animal product and zero grams for the plant product. For trans fat, it's, well, zero grams for the animal product, but you know that that could be zero or 0 0.5 and it's zero grams for the plant product, which is probably a little more accurate. For unsaturated fat, it's not listed for the animal product, and it's zero grams for the plant product. And for cholesterol, it's 40.5 milligrams for the animal product and zero milligrams for the plant products. Do you see what a big difference there is in the, this whole difference between the protein contents of plants versus animals. If you walk around the grocery store comparing things like this, it will actually shock you. 
Now just beneath the protein section, you're going to find the vitamins and minerals. And this is going to vary greatly by product because only the vitamins and minerals that are contained within that particular product will be listed. And the value given is the percentage of what's needed daily for a 2,000 calorie per day diet. You may not eat 2,000 calories per day. You may eat more or less. And it does not give you the quantity of the vitamin or mineral in milligrams in this particular section. And the finally, the last thing to notice on a nutrition label is the percent daily value. Now this is going to appear in two different locations. You'll see it in the green column on the far right and in the white banner across the bottom. The part I have highlighted in green will be on every nutrition label and it converts the quantities of each item into the percentage that each item should, compri should comprise in a 2,000 calorie per day diet. Basically, it helps you determine if a single serving of the food is high or low in a particular type of nutrient. And the general rule you can use for everything is that 5% is low, 20% is high for any given category. So, for the nutrients you need more of, 5% is on the low side. For nutrients you need to limit, 5% is okay. For nutrients you need more of, 20% is good. For nutrients you need to limit, 20% is on the high side. And of course, if you eat more than the serving size, you have to adjust these percentages accordingly. If it's 20% and you're eating two servings, then it's more than that, right? Which is too high for any nutrient in any given day. So this allows you to compare different brands of products using the percentages because the milligrams will be harder to compare. And finally, there's a white banner at the bottom and this is part is considered a footnote. You'll see that there's an asterisk in that box. Here's a close-up of what follows the asterisk. It says, percent daily values are based on a 2,000 calorie diet. Your daily values may be higher or lower depending on your caloric needs. So this white banner is just a reiteration of what you get in the other parts of the nutrition label that precede it. But instead of percentages, it's given you the milligram ranges. And that's a good thing because you'll only find this white banner on larger packages of food. It'll be missing on the smaller packages. Okay, there you have it. The bottom line is eat unsaturated fats, eat fiber, and eat plant protein. If you do that, you don't have to read labels or worry about getting all the nutrients you need. So how would I do, given the fact that I'm not a nutritionist or dietitian or anything even close. <laughs> that took a long time. <laughs> but I hope it helps you and I hope you're able to use it when you walk through the stores and look at nutrition labels. I'll see you in a week. In the meantime, follow me, subscribe to my channel, and I'll see you later. Bye!